going through the book of Genesis, and now we are in the last four weeks of this study in the book of Genesis. And we are going to now focus our attention on a man by the name of Joseph. And to start today's sermon, I'm going to start with a bad word that everyone knows and they have also experienced in their life. I hope this doesn't trigger any of you, but are you guys ready for the word? <laughs> it is injustice. We all here in this room in one form or another have all felt the sting, the heavy sting of injustice in our lives, sometime in our lives. And when we experience injustice, it is actually a traumatic event that is forever etched in our minds. Even as a nation, when we faced injustice on September 11th, 2001, the entire nation remembered where they were, what they were doing, and how they felt at the time that it had happened. And just to test each and every one of you, it's been 22 years since 9-11. 22 years. But how many of you in this place remember exactly where you were? Bingo. These events, these traumatic events of injustice that happens in our lives are forever etched in our minds. And it similarly, not only as a nation did we face this massive injustice, but personally, in our own lives, you and I have faced certain injustices in our own lives that we will be for that will be forever etched in the minds and seared in our minds and we'll never forget i remember 10 years ago when i was planting a, when i was first planting a church in dallas there were some events that were so traumatic and there was an injustice that had been occurred to me and it's been more than 10 years everyone but i still remember the night that it happened I remember where we were standing right outside the restaurant of where it happened, and I remember how bad I felt in my heart. Even 10 years, I have not forgotten that moment. There are moments of injustice where it happens to you, and you will forever be. This word injustice, I mean, it will, when it, when it happens to you, you remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, and how you felt. And if we're not careful, injustice can actually turn into something very like uh, evil and bad and debilitating in our lives. I want to just share with you that professionally and psychologically, professionals all know that injustice is debilitating. And some of the ways that injustice is, in, is debilitating is that, first of all, it gives all of us emotional distress. Like I said, when you remember, you remember exactly how bad you felt when maybe that person, a person yelled at you, maybe a person cheated on you, maybe a person left you and, or fought you, whatever injustice that had occurred in your life, it gives us emotional distress. And every time, and I don't know if you found yourself, if you find yourself in a similar situation, you start to tense up, don't you? Your shoulders start to tense. Your blood starts to boil. And so emotional distress is huge when we go through these moments of injustice. Second, there's a loss of trust. When someone feels that they have been treated unfairly or unjustly, it can create a deep sense of mistrust, making it difficult for them to form new relationships with new people and engage society in a meaningful way. If anybody has ever been there, you know what it's like to lose trust of a loved one who has betrayed you. 
Number three, professionals say that you have a decreased self-esteem. I think this is pretty much self-explanatory, but <clears throat> when a person faces injustice, uh, they may internalize the message that they are somehow less deserving or inferior. And so your self-esteem is shot because someone did something to you that you didn't feel like you deserved. And then number four, uh, we have an impaired social and occupational functioning. Uh, basically, experts say that injustice can hinder a person's ability to function uh, effectively in their social and professional spaces. Uh, just think of anybody who's going through the sting of injustice. They don't perform very well at work. And not only do they not perform well at work, but it's really difficult to uh, be around your peers and you want to sometimes be alone, which leads to often physical health effects. And <clears throat> the stress and the trauma that results from the injustice can have a physical consequences. Prolonged exposure to stress hormones actually weaken the immune system. And so when you're under a massive amount of du duress and stress, you actually tend to get more sick than when you're not. And then uh, two more, just six, number six, it inhibits your personal growth. Uh, again, this is self-explanatory, but injustice can create barriers to growth and personal development. And then finally, just to finish this off, uh, experts say that Injustice is debilitating in the sense that societal people can get into societal disengagement. Again, um, individuals who experience these injustices, they tend to withdraw from society as a coping mechanism. This can result in a reduced willingness to participate in community events, uh, contribute to social causes, or engage in civic duties. Uh, everyone knows when you are severely depressed and, you know, because of the emotional stress you get from injustice, you really don't want to do anything. Many times, I remember when I went through my period of injustice 10 years ago, uh, there were times where I didn't want to get out of bed. I just put the covers over my head and I didn't want to get, I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to engage with anyone. I wanted to quit the church. I wanted to leave as a pastor. I mean, there were so many emotions that really debilitates you when you are going through a massive injustice. So as we look at this list, there should be a question that, I mean, there's a question that I always ask myself and I often ask God during times like this. Can we ever heal from the injustices that occur in our lives. And if you're a little anything like me, I mean, when I'm going through that trauma of be having injustice put upon me, I always ask God, is this it? Is there going to be any more than this? And is healing even possible? Because at this moment, it feels really, really impossible, God, as I want to quit life. I want to quit everything. But the good news this morning is that the Bible text gives us a glimpse as to how it is actually possible to heal from injustice that occurs in our very own lives. Today, as we look at our text in Genesis chapter 39, we're going to meet a character by the name of Joseph who faced immense injustice in his own life, and we're going to see clues as to how he was able to overcome the massive injustices that were given in his life. And so let's, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Genesis chapter 39. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We're going to have them up on the screen for each and every one of you to follow. And we're going to read carefully as we read God's word. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, 
Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had, been, who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Now, we're going to park here for just a second before we go into the next few verses. This first portion that we just read is fresh off, coming off the heels of <clears throat> Jacob, I mean, sorry, Joseph being sold by his brothers into slavery. This was a massive injustice in Joseph's life. And I really, you know, it, it's, it's easy to see that if you have been betrayed by your own brothers, I mean, your own family members betraying you, I would imagine that for Joseph, he would have wanted to just go under the covers. He would have probably wanted to escape reality. He probably, like me, would have complained to God and said, why have you put me in this situation? But in this text, and in the beginning of this text, we see that there's nowhere in this text where Joseph complains to God. He doesn't go under the covers of his sheets, and he doesn't uh, escape from his reality. But we see here that in verse 2, he doesn't go into this depressed, you know, vegetative state, but instead we see that in verse 3, take a look at verse 3. It says that when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Potiphar actually exalts him to the status of chief of all um, slaves. This is, for me, this is really uh, key because Joseph doesn't wallow in his sorrows. He doesn't just stay where he is and starts complaining and saying, God, why did you put me here? Now this is, the sec this is the first time, you know, my brothers have abandoned me. I can't believe you did this to me. None of that. He actually lives life and works really hard. And it is his integrity. It is through his integrity of work that actually the, the Pharaoh, or the Potiphar, says, hey, God is with this guy. Uh, he must have had a really bad break in life, but you know what? He sure don't act like it. He's working really hard. He's a diligent worker, and his integrity is what makes Potiphar look at Joseph's life and say, this is a man or woman that's blessed. I often wonder when people look at my life, do they see God through my life and the integrity of my work and how, you know, uh, I, I do things in life, will people say, God is with that guy? Well, this is what Potiphar is doing and says, God is with this man, Joseph. But then as we go deeper into the story, it gets really scintillating. Because here, as we continue, it says, Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. And he said to her, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against 
God. Notice in this last line, how can I then do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You notice what he is saying here? In this, through this last line, we can see that Joseph had an understanding that God was with him. Even though he had a really bad break, and even though he had been deserted by his brothers, and he had a really bad break, he, Joseph lived a life understanding that God was with him. And if we have the same understanding that God is with us, watching our every move, and he is with us in the good and the bad, what Joseph is saying here is, how could I sin in front of God who is with me? I can't do such a thing. And so he lives by righteousness, and he makes the right choice. But, as you know, if, if anybody knows this story, you know that this woman, Potiphar's wife, is not going to take this. And so, as we look into the next verses, it says, One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought to us Came, to here, came here to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned, the husband Potiphar burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were were conf confined. <sighs> now at this point in Joseph's life, he had experienced not only one injustice in his life by his jealous brothers, but now he has experienced two injustices. How? This woman who kept begging Joseph to sleep with her, he would, he would keep saying no. And because she couldn't take no for an answer, she devises a plan where she tells the rest of the guards and her husband that this man tried to rape me. And he did not do any such thing. But she, she cried foul. And she said, he tried to rape me. And so what happens to Joseph? A man who didn't do anything wrong, he goes to jail for it. He did nothing wrong, but yet he goes to jail just because this wife lied and said, he tried to rape me. How does one get over such injustices that are occurred? How does one overcome such atrocities in their life? This question has been asked by many people, even artists and writers from centuries ago to even most recently. The Count of Monte Cristo was written by Alexander Dumas. Um, and so this story, if you've never read it, is an amazing story about how this man faced injustice by being wrongly imprisoned. And the entire book goes through the story of this character who is trying to seek revenge. Uh, by the way, those of you who watched the movie, the movie is great, but the book is even better. So check out the book if you ever have time. But again, this, the, the, the story, the real main premise of the story, the lesson that we can learn is Alexander Dumas is trying to tell the reader that vengeance is never going to solve your problem. 
As a matter of fact, the more you try to seek revenge, the more it's going to kill you. Revenge is like that slow poison, like unforgiveness, where you drink the poison thinking that the other person is going to die, but it's really you who's slowly dying. And Shawshank Redemption, in the 90s, there was a movie that came out that was just, I mean, awesome. Is there anyone in this room that hasn't watched it? Raise your hand. Okay. So just for the two people who haven't watched it, oh, man, I, I don't want to give up the, uh, I'm, I'm not going to try to give up the story to you, but it's worth watching. Because <clears throat> Shawshank Redemption is all about a man by the name of Dufresne, Andy Dufresne, who gets framed for murder that he did not commit. And he's in this prison cell called Shawshank, and the walls are confining. He can't get out. And everyone within the prison walls, from the warden to the chief of police, they're all using him. They're all using him. But this story, both, both in these stories, The Count of Monte Cristo and The Shawshank Redemption, what we love about these stories is the entire movie is not about Andy Dufresne, the main character, wallowing in pity and saying, oh man, I gotta get my revenge. It's not him wallowing in sorrow and, and saying, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna live my life anymore. What's the point of life? And it's, and none of these works of art portrays that. Rather, it portrays the positive side of what can happen when we switch our perspective. And this is what Andy Dufresne says. He says, I guess it comes down to a simple choice. Get busy living or get busy dying. Think about this for a moment. And this whole movie is really all precipitated around this concept of him living even within the death of the four walls of the prison. He doesn't let the four walls of the prison get him down, and he doesn't live this spiraling, depressed life of dying within the four walls of Shawshank. Instead, he actually lives, and again, I don't want to spoil the ending for you all, so for those who didn't watch it, but we see this redemption happen in his life because he didn't focus on the pain. He didn't focus and wallow in his sorrows and say, oh, I don't know why this happened to me. Uh, you know, and he wasn't devising this master plan of revenge. Instead, you see this beautiful story of him actually living the best life he could within the confinement of those four walls. And we see the same in Joseph's life. He lives, a great, he lives an amazing life. For a man who has been going through injustice, not only once, but now twice in his life, he lives a pretty amazing life. Look at how Genesis 39 ends. But while Joseph was in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who held, uh, held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. That's the final ending of this chapter. Nowhere in this chapter 39 of Genesis speaks of Joseph wallowing in his sorrow, planning a big uh, a revenge plot for his life, for the injustice that was done to him, none of that. And by the way, no doubt, I have without a shadow of a doubt in my heart that the hurt that he incurred from both his brothers and then this false accusation of rape, it no doubt hurt him. And it was traumatic for him. Yet what is the word? Do you, do you see a, a phrase that is often repeated in Genesis chapter 39? 
Has anybody caught it? And in the past, I have shared with you that in the Bible, when we read the Bible, sometimes it's good to read it like an investigative detective, like a detective. And in the Bible, there are themes that are repeated. And when something is repeated twice, I remember my seminary professor used to say, students, when it says something twice, it's really important. But then when the Bible says the same thing three times, it's epic. It's epic, and it'll change your life. What is the phrase that is repeated three times in this one chapter in Genesis 39? It'll answer the question, how was Joseph able to overcome injustice? In verse 2, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. And then in verse 21, if you look at verse 21, it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. And then finally in verse 23, it says it once again, and the Lord was with Joseph. Let that sink in for just a moment. Through all of the painful events in our life, through all the injustices that we have occurred in our life, through false allegations, through uh, pity, through all these other menial things that happen in our life. Can you say that the Lord was with you? Because if you can say that, then it will change your life. Andy Stanley says this beautifully. This is my application to each and every one of us this morning. He asked the question, how would your outlook on life change if you believed, if you truly believed that God was really with you? In every situation, whether good or bad, how would your life change? For Joseph, he knew God was with him. And so he didn't fall pity, he didn't fall prey to having a pity party for himself. But he was able to overcome that. And not only is the life of Joseph reflective of this truth, but we see in the book of Acts, Paul and his friend Silas uh, is going through a um, false imprisonment. And it says here in Acts chapter 16, verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Paul and Silas were wrongly, falsely imprisoned. And if you have been in that situation, I would say your outlook is very bleak. Life is not worth living sometimes. And it's very, very difficult. But in the midst of that injustice, next verse we see them saying, at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. How was, how was Paul and Silas able to be singing hymns and praising God in the midst of being jailed unjustly? How? Because they knew what Joseph knew, that no matter what situation they may be in, that God was with them. And I want to share with each and every one of you, out of the love, deep love of my heart, I know because I've been there and I've gone through it many times, that no matter what situation you may be facing, and no matter how deep and I mean how deep the injustice is in your life, whoever did it to you, no matter what they did, in the face of that pain, 
you are able to overcome knowing that God is with you. And you know this because he gave us Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the stamp of approval that God will be with you always to the very ends of the earth. Let's pray, everyone. Lord, in times of great injustice in our own lives, help us to know that you are nearer to us in the darkness than we could ever see or even imagine. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here in this room that is going through a dark period right now because of injustice, Lord, I pray that somehow you would speak to their hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit to encourage them and to let them know that you're with them, that you're walking beside them. And as Jesus Christ himself promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the ends of the earth. I will be with you. And even Paul said that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor anything in this world can separate us from the love of God. Father, I pray that you would sear that truth in the heart of every hurting heart in this congregation. That you would help them know that you are with them. And you'll never leave us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.